Before we get to this week's message, if these online resources have been meaningful to you, please consider going to newchurchtx.com slash give and show your support by helping make this ministry possible. Thank you. Welcome to the New Church Podcast. Coming up on three years in February. Three years. Yeah, we're starting to get a little more independent, more responsive to the other kids, learn how to develop friendships, starting to lose our baby fat, (laughs) maybe even learning how to share our toys. See, three-year-old new church, that's definitely not a toddler anymore. You know, when we started off, we started with a few things in mind. We wanted to be a church for people who aren't currently part of a church, either because they didn't grow up going, like me, or maybe they've been hurt by church people in the past, also like me. But from the beginning, we've tried to design New Church to be a place that's welcoming and not too strange for people who are just walking into a Christian worship service for the first time, which is a constantly moving target, you know? But it remains a goal nonetheless. Because we want to be a church where you don't have to leave your brain or your sense of humor or your sense of justice and mercy. We don't want to be a church where you have to leave those things at the door before you walk in, you know? We don't want to be a church that comes off as phony. We're not trying to sell Jesus with fake plastic smiles. We're not trying to scare people into buying pearly gate timeshares, like treating the gospel as some kind of fire insurance policy for the afterlife. See, we think people are actually looking for something real, looking for something that offers solid meaning and purpose for their life. Because this world seems like a pretty bleak, empty place sometimes, doesn't it? Everywhere you look, there's chaos and pain and hatred. And we believe that the God who created this world is the only hope that any of us have in this world. So we started New Church So we could share that hope with people who might not hear about it anywhere else. It's why we do what we do. And we think it's the most important thing in the world. This community where we gather to meet with each other and to meet with God. This place where we worship God and love people. Which is something that we say all the time around here, isn't it? Worship God, love people. What does that even mean? That's what I'm going to talk about today. The mission of New Church is to worship God and love people. See, we think this is supposed to be the basic meaning, the basic purpose for all of our lives. It's supposed to be the center of everything. It's God's will for us all individually and for everything that we do together as new church. Let's pray as we get started with this today. Father in heaven, we really do want to do your will. And we want to know what your will for our life is what your purpose for creating us and saving us and bringing us together in this place, what that purpose is. Lord, speak to us today through your word and show us what you want from us. And then give us the courage to do it and cover us with your mercy as we muddle our way toward being the people that you've called us to be. Amen. So our text today is Romans chapter 12, first two verses. 
It says this. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. This is the word of the Lord. So you've probably heard this before, but when you're reading the Bible and you see a therefore, well, the first thing you need to do is find out what it's there for. St. Paul says, therefore, by the mercies of God, present your body as a living sacrifice. So if we back up a little bit, try to find out what therefore is there for, what he's referring to, well, in this case, we got to keep backing up all the way to chapter one, because Paul has been describing the amazing mercy of God for 11 chapters, And then this is where he finally gets to the point of what he's talking about, right here at the beginning of chapter 12. But back in chapter 1, he was talking about how we all have let sin run all over us. We dishonor our bodies through all kinds of bad behavior. And then in chapter 12, he says that we're supposed to present our bodies to God. In chapter 1, He talked about how we wasted our life, worshiping created things. And then now, in chapter 12, he says to present ourselves as worship to the God who created everything. In chapter 1, he said that we once had undiscerning minds, but now he says that we're to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. In chapter 2, He said, we all know that God exists. There's a part of all of us that knows. But now he says that we need to test and discern what the will of God is, what he wants. So basically, this downward spiral of those early chapters, it finds its reversal, beginning right here in Romans 12. Therefore... Everything flows from God's mercy. Therefore, because he is merciful to us, we are to present ourselves as a living sacrifice. He showed us mercy because of Jesus. He forgave us, made us holy, made us acceptable to God, made it so we were able to come into his presence so we could speak to him in prayer so that we're able to hear his words of promise and hope and grace. See, all of this in spite of our best attempts to not listen and in spite of ourselves, in spite of our selfish, stubborn, lazy, angry, sad, petty, sinful, self-destructive ways. And nobody here should pretend for a minute that that didn't describe exactly who we are. But in spite of that, in spite of who we are, he has shown us mercy. And now, now that he's shown us mercy, what are we supposed to do in response? And he says that we're supposed to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. See, the world wants to conform you to itself. The world never sleeps. It never rests. Every moment of your life, whether you're awake or dreaming, the world is trying to bend you and twist you and distort you into something unholy, ungodly, something ugly. That's why we're constantly tempted to be the worst version of ourselves saying mean stuff, 
withholding kindness from people, defining ourselves by our pet sins, neglecting prayer, refusing to read God's word, skipping church half the time, wasting our time on distractions, and jumping with both feet into the outrage culture and just hating our enemies. The world, the flesh, and the devil, they want to use you to destroy everyone around you and to destroy yourself in the process. The world wants to conform you to itself. It wants to destroy our church and it wants to make everything that we're doing ineffective. But in spite of all that, God has shown us mercy. And therefore, we are to present ourselves as a living sacrifice. And living sacrifice is an oxymoron. It's a phrase that seems to contradict itself. Like, jumbo shrimp. Found missing. Or Microsoft works. Oh, come on, that was seriously funny. (laughs) Living sacrifice is a play on words. See, Paul was talking to people who knew all about making religious sacrifices. That was part of their daily life. The Romans and the Jews, when they wanted to pray, they would go to a temple and they would offer a sacrifice to their God. And whatever was being sacrificed, it was going to be stabbed, chopped, burned up on the altar. It certainly wasn't going to be living anymore. So what does Paul mean by living sacrifice? I think to find out, we got to look back to Romans chapter 6. Because in Romans chapter 6, it says, How can we who died to sin still live in it. Don't you know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. See, Jesus was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's the final, once and for all, perfect sacrifice to forgive us of our sins and to make us right with God. He was sacrificed on the cross, and he died. But that ain't the end of the story, because he did something that no sacrifice had ever done before. He came back from the dead. He rose from the dead, a living sacrifice. And then Paul explains in Romans chapter 6 that in our baptism, we were connected to his sacrificial death. Therefore, we were forgiven and made holy and we're not left dead either because we're also connected to his resurrection. So we become living sacrifices because we're connected to Jesus So we've been shown God's mercy. Mercy has been applied to us because we're connected to Jesus. So now what? What do we do now? It's kind of like God sent us a gift card in the mail. And then we open it up and we read it and, huh, cool, awesome. God thought of me and sent me a gift card. You ever, get a, you ever get a gift card and you put it in a drawer and forget about it? Or you put it back in the envelope and then accidentally throw it away, you can't find it? 
Last year, according to Market Watch Research, close to a billion dollars in gift cards went unused, unclaimed. Isn't that nuts? The gospel is not supposed to be an unused gift card. It's not what it's supposed to be. See, we become living sacrifices because we're connected to Jesus' death, connected to his resurrection. But Romans 12 tells us that we have to then present ourselves as a living sacrifice now. We've got to do something with it. We're not supposed to just put it in a drawer and forget about it. Philippians 2.12 says that we're supposed to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, which doesn't mean that we're supposed to figure out our salvation. It means we're supposed to work out what has been worked into us. We're supposed to do something with the salvation that we've been given. God has shown you mercy. Now go do something good with it. You gotta use that gift card. You gotta spend it. Hebrews 13.15 says, we should continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. See, all through the day, we should be offering praise and thankfulness to God, like everywhere we go. That's the worship God part. And in Philippians 2.17, it says, our faithful service, well, that's like an offering to God. And faithful service to God means serving other people faithfully. That's the loving people part. In fact, the very next verse, Hebrews 13, 16, says, don't neglect to do good and to share what you've been given, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Worship God, love people. That's what presenting ourselves as a living sacrifice means. That's what worshiping God means. See, people are always trying to make worshiping God as small a part of their life as possible. Like, keep it in a tiny little compartment. And I think St. Paul is just blowing the doors off that idea here. He's saying, because of the mercy that God has shown us, we got to go all out. Worship is 24-7, guys. But what about, what about that hour on Sunday morning? What about going to church? Are we, are we still supposed to gather for church services on Sunday morning and worship God? Is that also part of what it means to present ourselves as a living sacrifice? Yeah, absolutely. Hebrews 10, 25 says that we're not to forsake the gathering of the saints, the people of God. We're not to forsake the gathering together. We gotta go to church. But when we do, we're supposed to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. Which means that Sunday morning worship becomes the guiding principle for the rest of our life. We worship on Sunday morning And that sets our course for worshiping God with the other 167 hours of the week. You know, worship God, love people. That's really just another way of saying what Jesus told us was the greatest commandment. You remember that? The summary of everything God wants us to do. In Matthew 22, Jesus said, To love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. He said all the law and the prophets hang on those two commandments. We worship God by loving people. We do God's will by loving people. We got to go to church on Sunday, and then we got to spend the rest of the week 
working out our salvation and doing something with the mercy that God has shown us by doing stuff for other people. But the whole world is trying to keep you from doing that. It's trying to drag you down. The world wants you to sleep in on Sunday so you'll crawl inside your own head and get selfish. So you'll make everything about you. See, the world wants to conform you to itself. It doesn't want you to be transformed. It doesn't want you to be renewed. The world does not want you to present yourself as a living sacrifice. It wants you to be a dead pile of selfishness. Let's read our main text together. Let's all read it together out loud. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Transformed. See, to be transformed is to be reshaped, like the transformers. It's a change in our outward self, things that other people can see. And then renewed, see, that's more internal, like our mind, our emotions, our spirit. But it's our responsibility to let this change happen, both internal and external. See, this is a holistic and complete change. Like Jesus said, heart, soul, mind, strength, every part of us. See, the thing that happens when God saves us, and you can pick the word of your choice here, redeems us, born again, baptized, given new life, forgiven, shown mercy, all these words, they all basically mean the same thing. They mean that God has saved you by grace through faith in Jesus. He's the one who did it. He chooses you. He seeks you. Once you were lost, but now you're found. He found you. And here's the thing. You were completely passive in that part of the deal. You were connected to Jesus, and you were made like him into a living sacrifice holy and acceptable and pleasing to God. You just received that gift by faith. But then you got to do something with the gift. You got to present yourself. You've got to walk in a manner worthy of your calling. And no one is going to do that perfectly. That's why there's grace. But we do have a part to play in this. We have things to do. We got to start walking by faith. We got to tuck in that baby fat, make a few baby steps, try to be faithful. It's not going to be easy because we're doing it here in this sin-dominated, death-producing world of pain and sorrow in this nightmare horror story. See, we live here, we ha- but we have to resist the world. We have to resist the spirit of the age. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. We've got to resist the temptation to withdraw and to hide Resist making it a game of us against them. Because to love people, that means we got to be for people, no matter who they are. Because Jesus says if we're his disciples, we got to love our enemies. Not going to be easy. Not going to come natural. 
The world wants to conform you to itself. It wants you to fail. It wants you to die and stay dead. But that's not what Jesus wants for you. He gave his life so that you can live, so that you can have hope, so that you can have meaning and purpose. See, this is God's will for your life, that you would worship him, that you would love people. So that's what new church is all about. That's what we think life is all about, presenting ourselves as a living sacrifice, every part of our life. Not going to be easy. Every day, we're going to have to die to ourself and rise to Christ again. And if we call New Church home, guys, it means some other things too. It means we're going to step up and we're going to take ownership of this mission that God has given us. We're not going to take this place for granted. We're not going to grumble. This isn't just the place where we hang out with our friends and get spiritually fed each week. We're not babies anymore. We've got to find our place to serve. We've got to be generous. We've got to pray for the mission of New Church every day. It means we're going to show up on Sunday mornings to give thanks, to praise God for who He is, for everything He's done for us. We're going to continue to grow in our faith and in our knowledge and our understanding. We're going to be a living sacrifice. We're going to worship God and we're going to love people with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We're going to forgive each other just like God has forgiven us and shown us grace and mercy. A living sacrifice, active in the life of the church, which means we're going to eat and drink with sinners. And we're going to look for opportunities to talk about the hope that Jesus has given us. And then when we see an opportunity, man, we're going to go straight to awkward. Talk about that hope. And we're going to show each other kindness and gentleness and respect. And this transformation, this renewal that we experience And it's going to spread into the rest of our lives. We're going to live it out in our homes, with our family, at school, and at work, at the store, at the gym, even on social media. Even when we think we have the right to be right and everyone else is wrong. Because the way of a Jesus follower is to follow Jesus. And you know what? He had the right to be right. And everyone else actually was wrong. But he sacrificed himself for all of us. We are going to be a living sacrifice. It's the only way life's going to have any meaning. It's the only way our life is going to have any real purpose in this world. Because Jesus is the only one who gives us something real to believe in. He's our only defense against this world that wants to conform us into its twisted, unholy hopelessness. It's only by giving our life to Jesus that our suffering and our pain means anything. His promise of new life, of resurrection, it's the only hope we have in this world, guys. So we're coming up on our three-year anniversary in February, and we started this church with a few things in mind. Ways to worship God, to love people. And I am so grateful to have all of you to share this with, this spiritual family we have. I'm so thankful to have all of you 
to share this hope and this mission with. May God give us the courage to resist the world and to truly do his will as we're transformed and renewed into the people that he's called us to be. 